team, uh, everyone, and welcome to this Lung Cancer Europe Dialogue on what are the information needs on biomarker testing. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our top-notch panelists. Uh, I will start with Amy Moore, who is VP of Global Engagement uh, and Patient Partnerships at Longevity. Um, also, uh, Karen Clayton, Lead Lung Clinical Nurse Specialist as, uh, at East Cheshire NH NHS Trust and by Chair of Lung Cancer Nurses UK. Fernanda Pautasso, nurse specialist at Santa Casa de Misericordia de Porto Alegre in Brazil, patient navigator and member of the University of Patients and Family Caregivers, UPF. And last but not least, Nicole Wiki, program director at thesynergies.org, a member of the operational team of the FT3 from Testing to Targeted Treatments Initiative, who I would like to personally thank for her efforts in co organizing this live event together with with Luce. So thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for, for helping Luce with, with this. I would also like to thank, of course, all our panelists today very much for your valuable and precious time, because I know the agenda is pretty tight, and also to share your thoughts about the importance of biomarkers in the current diagnosis and management in lung cancer, and it's important in the life people living with the disease, not just, as we will discuss, from a physical or survival point of view, but also in the way it impacts the quality uh, of life, autonomy, and the way they cope with, with it on a daily basis. So uh, before we get started, I would like to give you a brief overview on the dialogue dynamics. So the session will last about um, uh, an hour, and we will start with the um, with a, a dialogue between um, in which we'll have Amy, Karen, and Fernanda. Uh, I'll be making some introductory questions for, for you, and then we'll have a fluent dialogue or debate, so please feel free to intervene, uh, intervene at any given time. Uh, and last but not least, Nicole will give us a brief introduction to the FT3 initiative so you can know more about it and get engaged. Um, for those of you who are attending the session today, you can raise your questions at any given time, and I'll make sure that I'll pass them to our panelists. So if you would like to make your questions live by using your microphone, you have to press the raise hand option in the bottom part of your screen, and I'll unmute you when it is your turn. Or if you prefer to send your questions uh, in writing, please do so by testing them in the Q&A or in the chat window, and I'll pass them through to um, our panelists. Also, you have the chance to enable the live transcription in the bottom bar, so you can read the automatically generated subtitles of the of the session. And finally, I'd like to remember that this session can be followed online at our Facebook page. So feel free to share it in your walls on through our social media networks and leave your comments there or, or questions. So um, being said that, and without further ado, I will start with the um, with the session. And I would like to um, to start asking um, from the point of view of you, Amy, uh, working uh, in longevity uh, as a patient advocate, engaging with patient in this in your organization. Uh, I would ask you what are some of the worries and concerns of people living people living with lung cancer when it comes to biomarker testing. Well, thank you, uh, Alfonso. And I think, you know, first of all, we're delighted to be here and uh, appreciate the strong work of Luce and FT3 to advocate for biomarker testing. And, you know, I'm a trained scientist, so I come at this from the perspective of understanding that biomarker testing really is, you know, a key step to improving outcomes for patients with lung cancer. We've made tremendous progress over the last decade or so in understanding really the molecular drivers, the biomarkers that are um, really fueling lung cancer. And as a result, because of research, we now have a growing um, list of target therapies and immunotherapy that are improving, extending, saving lives. And so, you know, we cannot uh, reinforce enough the importance for patients who are newly diagnosed to get that biomarker testing perform because again, knowing if you have a targetable biomarker and for your doctor to know if you have a targetable biomarker, that can inform 
optimal treatment to ensure optimal outcomes. And so that is one of our, you know, key areas of focus is just to reinforce that message, both for patients and providers, that for somebody who is diagnosed with lung cancer, it's imperative that they get that biomarker testing performed. And so I think, you know, when it comes to patient worries about that, it's just whether or not they've had that testing done, what the results are, what those results mean. Um, one of the challenges we find here, especially in the U.S., is that you know, that testing is not always done. We still see disparities in terms of testing and data that has been published and discussed at various conferences suggests that, you know, about only 50% of patients are getting that testing or getting next generation sequencing, which is the most comprehensive version of biomarker testing and what we advocate for because it gives you know, the most information possible. But then I think, you know, beyond just the sheer um, challenges of getting access to testing is then what do we do with that information? And do we have access to the, you know, appropriate drugs that are, you know, informed by that testing? And then, you know, I'm sure as Karen and Fernanda will discuss, then it becomes issues of, you know, financial concerns and, you know, can we afford you know, is there appropriate reimbursement for testing and can I afford the drugs that I might be a candidate for? Yeah, I think, I think and this is something that we may discuss. We, we are mixing here a couple of issues. One of them is access, which is, I think is a global problem, not, not just particularly in the US, but in any single given region. Also in Europe, we're experiencing this. And I know Fernando, from your perspective, probably is the same thing you know, in South, Central America, and so, and so on, Latin America. Um, and also that the, the issue of the information that patients get about biomarker. And in this particular sense, my next question uh, to make this kind of introduction before we move on to a more open dialogue uh, goes to Karen. And as you are um, a nurse, you are in touch with, with patients on a regular basis. Um, I would like to know what are the, some of the challenges that you found in, in the clinical practice and in your daily work when it comes to um, when it comes to biomarker testing or with patients which are mutation driven, with, 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 who are diagnosed with a mutation driven lung cancer. Okay. Well, welcome everybody and thank you very much, uh, Luce and, and Alfonso, for the invitation. Um, I am a lung cancer nurse working here in uh, the UK um, near Manchester, um, where we have the uh, renowned Christie Hospital. Um, we this morning in clinic, I was with a patient who his, has been diagnosed with adenocarcinoma and is waiting her biomarkers. Um, then biomarkers will be have been sent. We don't have an issue with funding as such in the UK. They will be sent if needed um, and have been sent off. I think one of the issues we have is time. Um, to be told that you've got a lung cancer diagnosis is huge. It's life changing. But then to be told that you've got to actually wait for treatment because we need to know what best treatment we're going to give you. Our patients can find that quite difficult to comprehend. And then that's when our communication skills come in to say, we need to wait for this. We need to make sure you're on the right treatment for your lung cancer. Um, so it's about that open communication and, um, and dialogue, if you like, with the patient to for them to try and understand that the yes, they've got this diagnosis, but we need to make sure they're going on to the right treatment. Um, I think one of the issues as well is that um, having, having then waited for those results to find that they haven't got a biomarker and they're going on to standard treatment, that can almost be like breaking bad news again. So it is about managing the patient's expectations um, and um, and waiting for that right treatment for them. It is, this probably is one of the, of, the, of the worst moment for the patient, this uncertainty okay. time while you are Absolutely. waiting for results in which there are a lot of questions, there is a lot of uncertainty, fear and doubts, and and, uh, and sure we, we can discuss deeper into that. So uh, this again links very well with my question to, to Fernanda. So you, also in your nurse practice, but also as a patient navigator, I'm pretty sure that you are in touch with a lot of patients. And I would like to ask you, 
well, in these first moments of the diagnosis in which the impact, uh, the emotion on psychology, so I, 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 I think it can bring to not being able to have enough autonomy to ask the proper questions or to really gather the proper information. I, I would like to know from your perspective, what are the questions that people can ask about biomarker testing or if they ask, if they, are they willing or are they concerned about the waiting times? Uh, do they ask about the, the meaning of the results or the treatments available? Or the shock at the very beginning is blocking them to become more proactive in their patient journey, especially at the very beginning. Well, um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here too. So thank you. And the patients uh, here in Brazil, where my experience is, uh, it's 16 years working with uh, cancer patients. Uh, in the beginning with the diagnosis of cancer, the patients have a lot of concerns. One of them are the time from diagnos diagnosis and beginning of treatment. When it comes to biomarkers, uh, tests, uh, not all of the patients, um, I think a little few of the patients, little pa uh, um, they don't have access to this kind of test. So we have a challenge here. Um, because we have to try to make them understand why they don't have access and why um, it's needed to. So they can ask for the government, go to a court, ask for a judge to uh, pay uh, for the government to pay for this test. When the patients actually can um, do this kind of test, I think the waiting time of, for the results are the most critical. They, got really confused. They want to start the treatment right away. And as a navigator and as a nurse, uh, we have to make them understand that this is the best for them because they're going to give them uh, for, um, individualized treatment just right for their diagnosis and the best for the best outcomes mm -hmm. of their treatment. So. Uh, as a nurse navigator, uh, I think Karen agrees with me. We have to be educating the patients to understand every step of their journey, every phase, every uh, exam, every test, every uh, treatment they're going to uh, to get by. So that's uh, the the challenge, uh, the most the great challenge for us here. So in Brazil, we have a lot of people that don't have. Uh, they can do this kind of, of tests. It is, it, is too, it is a shame because I know how much, uh, we know how much the patients could benefit from this here. And that's it. Thanks, thanks a lot. Before moving on to, uh, to the next question that I'm going to send to the three of you. So please feel okay. free the one, uh, the one who wants to jump in and, 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 uh, and answer. I would like to remind our attendees uh, that you can send your questions at any given time via Facebook or via the chat or the Q&A um, uh, window in, in, in Zoom. So my next question, because the three of you have been um, raising the issue about access uh, to biomarker testing, my next question would be, well, we know that in oncology in general and lung cancer in particular, precision medicine, biomarker testing is gaining more and more importance because we have now more targeted therapies in the particular case of lung cancer. We also have immunotherapy. And what is sometimes shocking to me is the fact that when performing a panel molecular testing, the cost is relatively low compared to the cost of treatment. It seems that there are still some challenges and some barriers for the regulators and the payers to have this available. On one side, I understand that not all centers are prepared, and you mentioned that very good, Amy, that not all centers have the proper, let's say, machinery or techniques to perform NGS testing or so on. But apart from that, what do you think are the challenges? And you mentioned also, Fernanda, the fact of influencing governments and payers on this. What do you think is the is the, the current issues around these denial sometimes of accessing a proper biomarker testing, even knowing that the evidence is showing that having an accurate diagnosis has a real impact in the outcomes for patients? So I open this question to the three of you, the one who wants to start first, it's very welcome to do so. 
Um, I mean, I'm happy to start. I think, you know, at least the experience here in the U.S. still points to the need for continued education and awareness of biomarker testing. I think, you know, as you said, lung cancer has really been a proving ground for precision medicine, but, you know, we still see variability whether patients are being treated in a large academic medical center or in a community setting where maybe those advances have not you know, uh, gotten all the way down to, you know, people who treat multiple forms of cancer, for example, maybe they're not specialists in lung cancer. So they're Mm -hmm. not as aware of, you know, what the latest biomarkers are or what the latest treatments are. So part of what we're trying to do from a longevity perspective is, again, really champion and educate you know, both patients and providers about the need for biomarker testing. But I think, you know, you still also see, you know, rather than NGS, maybe single gene testing in some cases where they incrementally go through the more common of the biomarkers in the lung cancer space and kind of try to, you know, rule them out. So, you know, of course, we advocate for NGS, next generation next generation sequencing is the gold standard, recognizing, as you said, that there are still barriers both here in the U.S. and globally to having access to that level of sophistication in terms of testing. But, you know, I still think there's a need for more education and awareness just about, you know, the need for um, and um, the importance of biomarker testing for patients with lung cancer. Absolutely. I think it's about empowering your patients as well for them to ask why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? You know, um, it, it's a lot more powerful when a, a patient asks um, for that for that test. Um, with regards to access, like I say, in the UK, we have got access. We don't have to go to the government like you do, Fernando, and, and ask that. That must be extremely difficult to deal with when you know that these drugs are there and they, they will help the patient to have to go through that extra hurdle must be uh, quite, well, extremely difficult and challenging. Um, but yeah, it is about empowering uh, empowering yourself really to find out about these biomarkers and ask, well, why can't I have this one? Will this one help me? You know, and really have the knowledge. Um, I've got a patient at the moment and I learn from her some half the time because she tells me you know, so, <laughs> well, I, I've got this, why can't I have this? Um, so, it, yeah, it is, it's about that constant learning, isn't it? Yeah, um, you're in Brazil. Um, I think <clears throat> the patients, we are empowering the patients to know what what mm-hmm. is the best for them. But as I said, they don't have access. It's too expensive, not just the, the tests, but the medications to treatment. <laughs> and the public health uh, insurance, they they don't pay for everything. So um, to prove to the government that this cost with this medication will reflect um, years uh, ahead uh, with patients treated with uh, a lot of better uh, quality of life, living um, better and uh, not going to the um, the health system for assistance, uh, for getting worse, for not treating their their disease uh, right. So here is our our barrier, um, our principal barrier is the cost of the medication for treatment after the test to prove the government that it's worth it to pay the medication, to pay the test for the patients to have a better quality of life, a better treatment. Mm -hmm. Great. We have received a couple of questions for our audience. The first one I know is a tricky one, and I know it's from from our experience in Lucha because we have been reporting this, but uh, the person is asking, what is the waiting time on average for biomarker testing results to be reported? I know it's tricky because it's very depending on the center, depending on the country and so on. But from your experience, what what would you ask to to this question? I can start with the experience in the U.S. And, you know, I think, again, as you say, it depends on where the testing is being conducted. If it's in a facility that has its own in-house testing capabilities versus a a facility where they have to send it out to be done. 
So, you know, it can rain from days to, you know, a couple of weeks, but um, I also just saw some data from ALK International, which consists of patients with ALK positive lung cancer in primarily in Europe. And they conducted a recent poll of their members and they saw anything from a couple of weeks to sometimes as long as a month. So again, there's great variability, but I think everybody tries to get it to at least, you know, less than or not longer than two weeks. You know, that's kind of the, the ideal, um, but again, a lot of variability depending on where the patient is. Absolutely. I mean, here in the UK, it depends, um, again, like you said, Amy, if it's done in-house or if it's got to be sent away. Sometimes it can be sent, um, what, 60, 70 miles away from where it was taken, where the biopsy was taken to have the biomarkers completed. It also depends on the sample. Um, we might be able to say that it's an adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, but there won't be enough tissue left for the actual biomarker. So we have to then go back to the patient, another, another biopsy. Again, that delays things. So, but on average, it's around two, three weeks that we'll get, um, we'll get the um, first generation sequencing EGFR, ALK, ROS, uh, PDL1. Um, so yeah, it's about, yeah, between two and three weeks. Here it depends of the, 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 the place that we send it to. Uh, from three weeks to two months, it depends. Thanks, it varies. It varies a lot. And we have another question from a, from from a person from one of our um, members in Luce, and um, it's it's a it's a good question. I have to say, uh, she's saying, is it ethical to inform the patient about NGS testing if this is not reimbursed in my country? Uh, as you also added, the financial toxicity might affect the whole family. So, uh, what would you, what would you say about that? So, because sometimes I have the feeling it also happens to me when when I, it comes to innovative treatments that sometimes you think it's even worse having a treatment and not being accessible for a patient rather than kind of treatment. Sometimes it seems to be more cruel. What's your your point of view on this? It, it's a complicated question, right? I mean, I think we would all agree that, you know, I have concerns as well about, you know, one, if patients get tested and then are matched to a, a certain treatment, and maybe their country doesn't even offer, you know, that best drug. So there are challenges there. In my experience, I, you know, I've worked with a patient in Canada who is having trouble getting her uh, physician to approve a liquid biopsy test, so that's test that's done on blood uh, primarily. And we were able to work with her through uh, Foundation Medicine, which is one of the companies that does testing to get that um, performed for her. So in some circumstances, it's possible to navigate that and work with testing companies. But again, you know, this is a much larger issue than we are able to really successfully do on a case by case basis. So there are challenges, and I think we all have to work together to improve global access, for sure. Absolutely. I totally agree with Amy. Um, it is working on that global to make sure that everyone's got the access, although it is extremely difficult. Um, from, from a fi I would imagine from a financial point of view, having to decide which way you use your, your, your family finances must be an extreme challenge, one that we don't tend to have in the UK, which is that's why I can't really comment on on the finances of it. I'm sorry. It's a challenge here in Brazil, but uh, we have to to explain to the patients what are the options, and I think it's worse uh, it's worse if they don't don't explain them what are the real options. And what can I offer now for their treatment in the, my in my public system, for example? So I think the patients have to have this information, and they have to understand uh, what what is their treatment and what we have from what are the best treatments. So if he, they want to go to the government and ask and go to the court and ask for payment for that, they can do that. So that's my point of view. <laughs> Great. 
We are still receiving some questions from our audience, but for going with them, I would like to touch base again on something that we have mentioned um, uh, during our conversation, which is about uh, the information and the education that patients receive on biomarker testing. From, from our experience at Lucha, we can really consider two type of profile of patients, let's say, is one of them that are very, like, let's say, engaged, especially when it comes to mutation-driven lung cancer, in which patients tend to be younger, more active, looking for information on the, on the internet, asking their doctors and so on, or having their own groups in which we discuss or re do some research about clinical trials, things like that. But on the other side, we have the vast majority of patients which really uh, are very scared about the, the, the diagnosis. They tend to be... Um, uh, relying on the doctors when it comes to the uh, treatment options and and it's more difficult for them to inform about different options, uh, treatment options, about the processes itself. So from your experience, what do you think is the best, the, the best way or the best tactics to try to inform patients throughout their patient journey, the best education awareness that you can make when it comes to to the information needs that the patient may have in, uh, in when, when it relates to biomarker patient-driven lung cancer? Well, at least in our experience, again, with uh, longevity, as you point out, there's, uh, you know, many different types of patients of all ages and, and backgrounds. And so we try to offer many different forms of educational um, resources. And so you know, some of that is online. For example, we recently launched a resource called our Lung Cancer Patient Gateways, which is a collection of six different portals broken out by biomarker or by uh, lung cancer subtype. So we have six of these titles, one for KRAS, one for EGFR, one for ALK, one for rare mutations and fusions, a general non-small cell, and then a small cell gateway where they can find lots of information and resources about their particular type. And so we think that's powerful. We have a, a library, extensive library of um, educational booklets and uh, brochures that explain what biomarker testing is, it explains what targeted therapy is or immunotherapy. We have um, various Facebook groups. And as you may, as I think all of us are familiar with, at least in the lung cancer space, there are a number of patient groups that have arisen that are defined by biomarker status. And so from groups like the EGFR resistors and Ross Wonders to ALK positive, there are about 10 or 11 of these groups now. Um, and that's often a great place and opportunity for patients to connect with others who are going through similar experiences and share, you know, their um, experiences and, and what they're dealing with. So um, there are those groups as well as our own Facebook, um, on longevity Facebook groups. So we try to provide different venues and opportunities for patients to connect and find what resonates with them and their needs. I think at the uh, beginning, uh, when first diagnosed, it's really important not to overwhelm and just talk about a biomarker in general until we actually know which type we're we're dealing with and then we can be a bit more focused on the information that we give and um, we will be we'll, we'll, we'll just talk in general terms of biomarkers until we know they're EGFR positive or they're ALK positive and then sort of home in on the information that's pertinent to them so they don't get too overwhelmed um, with the information and you know talking to the health professionals and coming back and saying well you said this but I'm not sure about that uh, and also like, again uh, echo what Amy says about the social media groups are a real good source of information um, and that peer support as well, someone that's got what you've got and going through the same sort of process and treatment as you are. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important, but at the beginning we tend to stay, stay very generalised until we know which one we can focus down on. I think education is a process, like Karen said, in the beginning we have to give uh, some information, uh, some resources so the patient can go and read and try to know more about their, diagno their diagnosis and in the, in the journey. So when we know what kind of tests or treatment are specific for the patients, giving the resources, the reliable resources, because uh, every patient 
uh, when they first know they have cancer, lung cancer, they go to Google, yeah, <laughs> they go to the internet. So we, we know that Google is not the, the best resource of information uh, specifically on cancer. So we try to give them the reliable resources to answer their questions along, uh, along the process of uh, along the journey uh, of the cancer treatment and start is starting with this educational process slowly in the patient time and mm -hmm. is trying to to work with them to engage with them and to engage the patient to participate of their treatment to be more um, in contact with the team the health team so thank you thank you uh, so I have another question from uh, for an audience, just to let you know that apart from writing, if you prefer to do your your questions live uh, using your microphone, just press the raise hand button and I will unmute you when it is your time. So the question comes to something that you mentioned before, Amy, which is uh, what are the expectations regarding liquid biopsy in line cancer diagno diagnostics and how is this changing clinical practice? Well, I think, you know, it's important to understand that uh, tissue biopsy still remains the gold standard for uh, confirming a diagnosis of lung cancer, but liquid biopsies are growing in use, especially, you know, if we heard, you know, if tissue cannot be obtained for some reason, then liquid biopsy can be utilized. And for, you know, uh, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, ISLC, recently came out with a consensus uh, statement about the use of liquid biopsy in lung cancer. And so it is a nice complement, I think, to our tissue-based testing. Um, you know, the, the, for those who don't know what liquid biopsy is, it's looking for tumors can shed DNA or other um, cells or other molecules into the blood, but most often we're testing for DNA in the blood from the tumor and looking for those biomarkers that we've been talking about. And so in uh, some cases, tissue and blood can be tested in parallel. Sometimes it's done sequentially. You know, one of the challenges with uh, blood-based testing is if the results come back negative, you still have to go and, and confirm that result with tissue-based testing. So it can be um, a nice complement. It also is it, um, useful at the point of progression. I know we've been talking more about the point of diagnosis, but for patients who develop resistance to a given uh, targeted therapy, for example, you know, they can often go in and have blood-based testing to try to understand if there's a specific resistance mutation or another uh, driver mutation that might be targetable. So it's growing in use, you know, we're still um, seeing its maturation in terms of how we, how we incorporate it into our lung cancer kind of uh, care continuum, but I expect they'll become more um, utilized in coming years as the technology continues to move forward. Great. So um, my next question, it's um, also about something which is the patient preferences or, or how they from your experience, how they feel, uh, as you know, uh, at the moment, many of the uh, of the mutations like ALK, ROS1, EFR, they are being treated with uh, TKIs, with, uh, with oral treatments that they can take in an outpatient setting without the need of attending to the hospital. And in some sense, we, we have seen that there are like a couple of uh, profiles of people, some of them preferring this because it tends to be more comfortable to them. Uh, on the other side, some of them feels a little bit, um, I wouldn't say unsafe, but not so uh, confident as they are not, they might prefer to, to get into the hospital uh, and, the treatments and so on. So my question is, what, what's your experience on these? Um, are you uh, witnessing a kind of adherence issues when it comes to these kind of oral treatments from the patient for, uh, 
which might be caused by involuntary uh, issues, like I forgot to take the pill at the right time, or so on, or sometimes it might be due to side effects that they may prefer not to take the pills or something like that. Have you have you had any experience or do you have any kind of point of view when it comes to, to this new type of treatments which are becoming more and more popular to treat uh, this particular type of lung cancer? I think from an adherence point of view, we don't really have any trouble um, because patients understand that this is the, the medication that's holding this cancer at bay or, you know, um, so that's not necessarily the trouble. Um, we have to work a lot about reporting symptoms and not sitting on, you know, not sitting on symptoms thinking, oh, well, I'll be, I'll be fine tomorrow. Let me see how I'll go on tomorrow. Um, you know, we want to know if you're having extreme symptoms from these TKIs. Some of them can be quite dangerous if, we're, if left. Um, so it's not necessarily the adherence. Uh, I mean, you know, I think sometimes patients, we have had patients where they won't report symptoms um, because they're in fear of the tablet being taken away and, and stopped. Uh, we've had that, um, not necessarily that they're not taking it, that actually they won't report side effects because um, of the fear of this medication being taken away. Um, that We've had that quite a, a couple of times now, a few times now. Um, going on when they've taken the tablets, a lot of people like it, you know, they can get on with life, they can almost forget. Um, I've had patients tell me they can almost forget that they've got a cancer on board because to them it's just like taking another pill. Um, and they can just get on with life. Like you say, some people like that regular contact. Um, it's personal choice, isn't it? Um, but we do have to emphasize about reporting the side effects. Um, the severance problems uh, with oral therapy, uh, here are our comments. We have to, to call for the patient from time to time to understand how they are they are uh, taking the medication with the right orientation because sometimes some side effects or symptoms, they just stop taking the medication from one hour to the other. So we have to um, keep uh, with the patient all the time until we know, we understand that we gave them uh, a lot of information and they really understand the importance of the therapy. Yeah, and yeah. the two, to make the right adherence to that. That's it. This is a major area of focus for our organization at Longevity. And we have a what we call our patient force or patient focused research center that's oriented toward this specific, you know, conversation and you know, collecting patient reported outcomes, looking at the lived experience of the patient. So we have various surveys that we conduct, some of which are international in scope to collect this data. And I think it's also a growing area of interest among the different patient groups that I talked about. So I recently helped facilitate a research roundtable with the Ross Wonders um, patient group, and they're looking at or exploring the opportunity to collect real world data among their patients um, to inform you know, research projects and, and to improve outcomes for patients with ROS1 positive lung cancer and other rare mutations. So I think this is very much top of mind for patients is, you know, what, what are they experiencing and, you know, how can we um, collect that data in a meaningful manner to inform, um, you know, our understanding of, of these side effects and better manage side effects, better manage toxicities. You know, there's discussion about what's the maximum tolerable dose for patients um, you know, so a lot of interest and in, I think growing momentum in the area of patient report outcomes and in real world data and, and real world evidence. Thanks. Thanks for, for that answer. Um, um, my ne next question has to do with the fact that we know now due to evidence that the, that certain type of uh, biomarkers in lung cancer are linked with the fact that there are more treatment options available uh, and also the, the, the we are gaining uh, an improval in terms of outcomes for patients, not just in survivorship, but also in, in the quality of life. 
do you see in your experience that patients who are aware that they are being tested positive in a particular biomarker is linked with the fact that they have more treatment options, that they can have more quality of life, or even sometimes thinking, even though I, I take it with, um, with some caution, the fact that their disease could be chronified in a sense, or, mm -hmm. or you you don't you don't think that's the, 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 there's a real link when it comes to a patient and they are say, being said you have this kind of mutation. I don't think there's much. I don't, I don't think patients think of it as a chronic disease um, at the time that they're, they're starting their journey. Um, you know, once they've been on it for a few months, a couple of years, then maybe that's the sort of conversation we would have. But at the beginning, when they're starting out, um, I'm not sure they think of it as a chronic disease. I, you know, is anybody, any patients out there that want to challenge that? Absolutely. But I, I don't see that often. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, hope is palpable among the lung cancer community, maybe for the first time ever, you know, because we are seeing meaningful advances in the delivery and in use of, again, targeted therapy and immunotherapy, which are beginning to chip away at lung cancer mortality. But, you know, um, stark reality is five years survivor uh, survival rates are still in the in the 20s and, you know, 22 percent or so. So. We have a long way to go, but I think, you know, when we look at EGFR or ALK, where we have, you know, a handful, you know, of options, that's giving patients good many years in many cases of quality life. Now, you know, if you look at some of our more recent biomarkers like KRAS G12C, we have one approved drug and hopefully another one coming in the near future, but I think patients maybe with uh, that mutation are a little more concerned about, well, what's what happens when this drug stops working for me. So I think, you know, even for patients who have one of the um, biomarkers for which we have a number of drugs, it's always in the back of their mind, you know, when will I develop resistance, uh, you know? And so hopefully in time we can have more people who, um, for whom it is a chronic disease and we can manage it for a number of years and with good quality life. But um, the reality is we're not there yet for everyone. So we still have work to do. Great. Uh, there is a question from our audience. Uh, we still have some, some time for questions from our audience. I would also like to ask you something about that. This came and says, is biomarker testing necessary following by surgery? I guess it may depend, but if you if you want to uh, answer the questions the question um there's lots of discussion about adjuvant treatment with biomarkers um post surgery um but um all that we would test the surgical sample if a patient uh, recurs or progresses and um, see whether they've got a biomarker at that point um but there's lots and lots of work going on about um adjuvant treatment using biomarkers. We yes, and we're definitely on? seeing more, um, you know, movement of both target therapy in the case of like os osimertinib and immunotherapy mm -hmm. into earlier um, stage settings. And that will probably continue, you know, as we see more biomarkers move into this settings. There is a lot of um, discussion about biomarker testing and the appropriateness of it for mm -hmm earlier stage disease, you know, um, in the kind of perioperative uh, setting. Good, so um, I'm gonna go with another question, uh, probably before asking you for a kind of closing remark before giving the floor to Nicole, um, which is, it has to do with the role of patient organizations in this um, educational, uh educational stuff when it comes to patients so what do you see the role of patient organizations here in terms of information education and also how do you think is the best way to engage with other stakeholders involved to really make sure that the patients get the most out of knowledge who allows them to be 
more self-sufficient when dealing with the disease and cope with the disease on a daily basis in the best way possible. Um, well, I'll take that one to start since I'm a representative <laughs> of the one advocacy organization here. Um, you know, it, it obviously this is a, a major area of focus for us is increasing education and awareness and working with stakeholders around the world to do that work, um, to really reinforce the message about the importance of biomarker testing. So, um, you know, recently we have launched a campaign called No One Missed that is oriented toward patients right now to make sure that they know to get tested and that they know what their biomarkers are, but we're also getting ready to um, direct that toward providers. And now we're getting ready to, you know, take it global. So we'll be working in various countries to get that message out. But, you know, here in the U.S., we work with a number of stakeholders from, um, you know, industry to government to other advocacy groups, patient groups to really try to get everybody on the same page about the importance of biomarker testing. So it takes, you know, all the players and, and we're here to support the work of you know, um, people like Karen and Fernanda who deal directly with the patients and are helping navigate them and, and um, guide them through this conversation and, and help them understand, you know, help them get the testing and understanding what those results are. So I think advocacy organizations play a critical role um, in advancing this conversation. Absolutely. I think peer support is very, very powerful. And um it might be a, a comment from someone who's got the same cancer, some the same biomarker as you, that you think, oh, I'll ask about that next time. You know, and that and that can be that that's education in itself. You know, I always say to my patients, I can empathize with you, I can't sympathize with you. So having that, um, having that power, having that, like I say, peer support from someone that's going through the same thing is extremely powerful and very educational for them. Um, and I think the, the social media groups that, you know, the, the information that they are giving is true and proper. I'm with Fernanda. I, I, I worry about Dr. Google, you know, and, and the, the stuff that's out there um, and, and make sure that patients are actually going to the right places for the right information. Um, but I'm a big advocate of patients um, educating themselves, getting themselves knowledgeable. I, I love it when a patient comes into clinic and has a a page full of questions because to me that that's that's great that's great conversation and then I know that the patient is getting the answers that they need so um yeah it is it's very powerful they're very powerful they're very important exactly what Karen and Amy said for information for the patient so we can uh, they can help them with these resources you will not go to Google, and uh, I I really like when the patient comes with with a page with a lot of questions to yeah. Karen. So because they go uh, search for information before uh, the meeting yeah. with me, so that's the best scenario that we have. And I think all those uh, organizations they help the patients to do that, so they come more informed to the service, and they can discuss and talk with their their doctors the best options for their cases and knowing about that with the right information so that's very hard thanks a lot so uh, as i can't see any more questions coming from our audience and to make sure that we finish uh, on time and give enough proper time for nicole to uh let us know a bit more about the ft3 e initiative I would like to ask you, Amy, Karen, and uh, and Fernanda, for uh, a, a kind of closing remark of this session. Uh, what would be your key message, someone that you would like our audience to take away, and uh, which you consider is the most important of what we have been discussing today? So I don't know who wants to start, but uh, after you, um, let's do that. Well, <laughs> Uh, just, you know, reinforcing that lung cancer has really become biomarker driven in the last you know decade or so. And so getting that testing is critical because getting that testing gives you the best chance for optimal outcomes, getting matched to the most appropriate treatment for you. And as we've heard, it's, you know, these treatments are 
you know, tolerable, they're giving good quality of life. And so I would just encourage everyone to be aware and to ask if they've had that testing, if not to, to get it, um, if they can. Definitely. Um, I would say um, ask about the testing, ask if it's been done, ask if it can be done. Don't overwhelm yourself with which marker might be yours. Wait until you know for definite and then really do some research on, on what it is um, and what the drugs are and what you should be looking out for um, and talk to your health provider about what um, and the side effects. And um, yeah, be informed. Yeah, information empowers them. Yeah. So be informed. Ask <clears throat> for the best treatment, for the best test, and ask for their rights because they have the right to have the best and the individualized treatment, the individualized uh, care. So information is the key, education is the key. So thank you so much. We take away this message of being empowered, ask get informed, know more about treatment options, about the diagnostic itself. And uh, I would really like to thank you, Amy, Karen, and, uh, and Fernanda, your participation. I think the discussion has been very fruitful and very interesting, and I am pretty sure our audience has really enjoyed, enjoyed that. So uh, right now, before closing the session, I would really like to give the floor to uh, to Nicole, to Nicole Wiki, who, as I mentioned before, is the program director of the Synergist.org and part of the operational um, operational uh, team of FT3 from tested to targeted treatments, an initiative who, which is aiming to accelerate the benefits of precision medicine by generating better evidence, creating awareness, and building the conditions for better access to targeted medicine in oncology and beyond. So, um, Nicole, the floor is yours. I'm director, working with the synergists and with the From Testing to Targeted Treatments or FT3 program. So as Alfonso mentioned, this is a open collaborative program that really looks to um, be a global convener an accelerator and a connector to really enhance understanding of and uptake of precision medicines, really improving patient outcomes and quality of life, tackling systemic barriers, generating the, the right evidence um, and creating um, adaptable educational resources and other um, toolkit elements for different stakeholders to use locally to um, make progress in precision medicine, however it works in their local context. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention today to, um, to those of you attending is with respect to a, um, an initiative that we have at FT3, which is a library of um, patient stories. So what we're looking for, and it's a bit of a call to action to those of you in the audience today, um, is to, to share your, your lived experience with us as individuals um, living with lung cancer or caring for someone with lung cancer. We're looking to collect these um, patient experiences throughout the care pathway, um, applying those against a common visualization or framework that can really enable comparisons and highlight different learnings. What are some of the different pain points in the patient care pathway? So really helping us to understand um, where are the areas where maybe we need to collect and generate more evidence, where can we work together on a multi-stakeholder level to improve that um, point of care patient experience, um, especially as it comes to biomarker testing and biomarker driven care. So um, Alfonso has posted a link in the chat. So I encourage you all to take a look at the FT3 website, reach out to us if you'd like to learn more and, um, and certainly reach out to me if you would be interested in sharing your lived experience with us. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you and, and be connected. And as a last note, um, since you guys have been talking quite a bit about, um, about education and patient education in particular, one work stream in FT3 that we've been working on is the development of adaptable resources. So specifically for patient organizations or other stakeholders to take um, based on best practice models, different adaptable resources that can be 
customized to different disease or, um, or country contexts. So we, right now we have a, a Q&A resource to help with what questions to ask your healthcare team when it comes to precision medicine. Um, also one on the basics of biomarker testing and we have one on targeted therapies and development. And so of course, working with, with Luce, with Longevity and our members to co-create those adaptable resources. So, um, so yeah. Thank you all for your time today and please share your, your experience with us. Reach out if you'd like to learn more and, um, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Nicole. And then we are going to, to be ending the, the session. So again, I encourage you to uh, follow uh, what Nicole just, just said. It's uh, please go into the website, Please share your experience there. Uh, you will find a lot of quality uh, information in the, in the site. And of course, if you have any kind of questions, you can contact us at any given time. I would like to thank you, Karen, Amy, Fernanda, Nicole, your time today for, uh, for uh, that you have shared with us. I think it's been a very fruitful and very enjoyable conversation on such a hot topic for the lung cancer community. Nicole, once again, for all your kind support during these months preparing this dialogue, it, it would have been impossible without your support. Thank you very much. I owe you a big one. And thank you to all your audience for, um, for attending today. We really hope that this session has been very fruitful. I would just like to remind you that this is the recording on the session would be short, uh, shortly available in our YouTube channel and in our website, which is www.lancancereurope.eu, and that you can uh, keep on following up our coming activities in our social media networks like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter. And uh, so I would like to wish you all a very nice evening and I'm really looking forward to meet you all in our upcoming activity. And once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. So enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.